Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to today's lecture, The United Nations Climate Regime 30 Years On, a Retrospective and Assessment by Professor Daniel Budansky, Center for International Laws Visiting Distinguished Global Scholar, organized by CIL and supported by the Asia Pacific Center for Environmental Law. I am Ray Lapuno, a research associate with the CIL, and I will be your MC for today's lecture. Professor Badansky's lecture will be followed by a moderated dialogue. If you have questions for a speaker or any of the discussants, you may send them through Mentimeter, which you may access through the QR code above. You may also upvote others' questions if you find that they are similar to yours. Without further ado, let me, let me invite Dr. Nilofer Oral, Director of the NUS Center for International Law for the welcome remarks. Dr. Oral is... <laughs> Can I give the introduction? Okay, oh. go ahead. <laughs> no need for introduction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aurela. So, as director of the Center for International Law at the National University of Singapore, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you today. The CIL was established as a university-level research center at the National University of Singapore in response to the growing need for international law thought leadership and capacity building for the region. So as part of our mandate, CIL engages with leading scholars from around the world on different topics of international law. So CIL is very pleased to be hosting Professor Dan Vidansky as a CIL visiting distinguished global scholar. Professor Budansky is a very well-known, very eminent uh, scholar in climate change, international environmental law, and also international law as well. Now I take the opportunity to thank NUS Asian Pacific um, uh, Environment Center for supporting CIL and hosting this event today. APSL is a leading center for research and scholarship in the field of environmental law. So I take this opportunity to thank Jolene Lin, uh, the director, as well as Vincent Joel Pru, Alicia Chow, and Joel Howe for all their efforts. And of course, I have to thank CIL's own Daniel Yao, uh, the lead of our climate change program, and also uh, Ray La Puno. Climate change is the greatest challenge facing the world right now. And in just a few weeks, governments will gather in Egypt for COP27, which marks the 27th year that the governments have been meeting under the, con the UN uh, framework for um, the Convention on Climate Change. However, 2022 marks the 30th anniversary of the landmark Framework Convention on Climate Change. Professor Budansky is one of the eyewitnesses and contributors to the development of the climate change regime over the three decades since adopted. He is able to bring a unique and very informed perspective on the past 30 years. So I very much am looking forward to his lecture on the UN climate regime 30 years on, a retrospective and assessment. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ral. And now I have the honor of introducing the man of the hour, Center for International Law's Visiting Distinguished Global Scholar, Professor Daniel Badansky. Professor Badansky is a Foundation Professor of Law at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law of Arizona State University. He has a preeminent authority on global climate change and teaches courses in international law and sustainability. He has served as a climate change coordinator and attorney advisor at the U.S. Department of State, in addition to consulting for the United Nations in the areas of climate change and tobacco control. Since 2001, Professor Bodansky has been a consultant and senior advisor on the Beyond Kyoto and Pocantico Dialogue projects at the Pew Center on Global Climate Change. He serves on the board of editors of the American Journal of International Law, is a U.S. nominated arbitrator under the Antarctic Environmental Protocol, 
and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the American Society of International Law. His awards include an International Affairs Fellowship from the Council of Foreign Relations, a Pew Faculty Fellowship in International Affairs, and a Jean Monnet Fellowship from the European University Institute. He co-edited the Oxford Handbook of International Environmental Law and is the author of The Art and Craft of International Environmental Law, which was awarded the 2011 Harold and Margaret Sprout Award from the International Studies Association as the best book published that year in the area of international environmental politics. We are all very for fortunate to have Professor Badansky with us today, and so please join me in welcoming him to the podium, Professor Badansky. Thank you very much, Raila, for that uh, very kind introduction. And I want to thank the Center for International Law here at the National University of Singapore for inviting me uh, to be here for six weeks this fall, and to Nilo for uh, Daniela and Raila in particular for hosting me here. So thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to speak to you about the uh, UN climate change regime. Uh, as Millerfer mentioned, I've been involved in the climate change regime, uh, not quite from the beginning, but pretty close. I, I attended uh, the three, last three sessions of the negotiating committee uh, that negotiated the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And then I've been involved in the process ever since. So what I wanted to do today was provide a look back over the last 30 years and then provide a little bit of an assessment as to where we are today on the climate change issue. So my talk's gonna have uh, four parts. Uh, I'm gonna be talking first about the development of the UN climate change regime, uh, then about the continuity and change over the 30 years uh, that the regime has existed, uh, discuss the Paris paradigm in some detail, and then provide an evaluation of the regime, a report card on the regime at age 30. So the climate change uh, problem uh, should be familiar to most of you. It's caused by the fact that the Earth's atmosphere is transparent to incoming sunlight, but then re-radiates heat back out, and the atmosphere is not transparent to the heat that's re-radiated back out. It's trapped in the atmosphere and hence warms the Earth. It's a natural phenomenon that's well accepted scientifically. Uh, the only questions about it relate to the uh, additional warming humans are causing through the emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, we've been directly monitoring, measuring CO2 in the atmosphere for 60 years now. Uh, and the graph on the right shows this steady increase uh, in atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases since the late 1950s. Um, there are other greenhouse gases that are important as well. And these gre enhanced greenhouse effect is causing warming. It's already occurred. The Earth is about a degree warmer than it was pre-industrial levels. And that's already causing effects, um, uh, extreme heat events, uh, extreme weather events, uh, and other uh, changes uh, in the environment. So the climate change uh, first came onto the international agenda in the late 1980s. And the UN climate regime has been developing ever since. And I like to describe the development of the regime as a play in four acts. The first act was the negotiation and adoption of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992, which established the basic system of governance for the regime. Uh, the second act was the negotiation of more specific uh, emission targets in the Kyoto Protocol. Then the third act was an attempt to make the regime more global in the Copenhagen Accord. And then the final act, which we're still in the midst of, uh, involved the negotiation and implementation of the Paris Agreement. Uh, so let me describe these four acts in a little bit more detail. So the first act uh, is really the constitutional phase of the regime, when the basic structure of governance of the UN climate change regime was established. So the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change establishes the ultimate objective of the regime, some general principles. Uh, it establishes the basic institutions of the regimes, including, most importantly, the Conference of the Parties that meets yearly. Um, it sets some basic uh, uh, obligations relating to reporting and review. Uh, it established the two annexes uh, that uh, differentiate between different countries uh, based on their development level. Um, it was uh, adopted in 1992, entered into force in 1994, and the first COP was held in 1995, COP 1 in Berlin. So the second act involved the development of binding targets. So the Framework Convention did not establish any binding emissions targets. Uh, there were attempts to negotiate that at the Framework Convention, but they failed. Uh, instead, the Framework Convention only established a general aim for developed countries of returning emissions uh, to 1990 levels in the year 2000. So 
no binding obligations. Uh, the next phase of the regime, the Kyoto Protocol, involved the negotiation of binding uh, emission limits. Uh, and uh, I'd like to just highlight three features of these uh, emission limits. Um, first, uh, they were legally binding. Uh, secondly, they applied only to developed countries. And third, they could be implemented by parties using a variety of market mechanisms, including emissions trading and a credit-based uh, mechanism called the Clean Development Mechanism. Because the negotiations focused primarily on, or almost exclusively really, on developed country emission targets, the main axis of the negotiation was between developed countries and primarily between the US and the EU. And I was involved at the tail end of this process as the climate change coordinator at the State Department. And we used to describe the outcome from Kyoto as EU targets US architecture because the targets in the Kyoto Protocol were stronger than what the US wanted going into Kyoto. This was during the Clinton administration, uh, stronger. But the architecture that came out of Kyoto was a market-based architecture which the US uh, favored that allowed for uh, implementation of targets using these uh, market mechanisms, including emissions trading. So Act 3, uh, which culminated in the adoption, or the not the adoption, the, the, I guess the adoption and taking note of the Copenhagen Accord in 2009, was an attempt to make the regime more global because the Kyoto Protocol targets uh, only applied to so-called Annex 1 countries, those were developed countries, uh, there were no emission targets set for developing countries. So Act 3 was an attempt to make the regime more global in its uh, focus um, so that uh, it involved uh, emission limitations not only for developed countries but for all countries in the world. Um, so as a result, the main axis in the negotiation uh, was uh, between developed and developing countries rather than within, develop, uh, within the developed world, uh, between the uh, US, European Union, uh, and uh, developing countries such as China, India, Brazil, South Africa, and many, many others. Um, in contrast to the um, uh, Kyoto Protocol approach, the Copenhagen Accord took a bottom-up approach, which allowed individual countries to define what they were going to do to limit their emissions. Um, each country got to decide and pledge what it were, was going to do uh, in the field in the relation to mitigation and adaptation to climate change. And also in contrast to the Kyoto Protocol, the pledges that countries made uh, under the Copenhagen mechanism were not legally binding. Uh, they were simply pledges, not legal commitments. Um, so two key differences between the uh, Kyoto approach uh, and the, um, uh, the Copenhagen approach and the Kyoto approach. Um, both of these ships, shifts, I think, were essential to get buy-in uh, from many countries, including not only the US, uh, but big developing countries such as China and India, um, making uh, the targets nationally determined and making the targets non-legally binding. And as a result, the, Kyoto Pro uh, the Copenhagen Accord, in contrast to the Kyoto Protocol, got much, much more participation. Uh, many countries submitted pledges under the Copenhagen Accord uh, to uh, limit their emissions in some fashion. Uh, now, the final act, uh, the one that we're still in the midst of, or what may be the final act, is the, uh, is the Paris Agreement. Um, and uh, I'm going to come back and describe the Paris Agreement in much more detail uh, later, but uh, it was negotiated uh, in the period between 2011 and 2015 uh, when it was adopted. It involves almost universal participation. And then, really, the Paris negotiations were extended another three years because it took another three years to negotiate the rules for how the Paris Agreement uh, was going to work. So in this 30-year period from uh, 1992, when the Framework Convention was adopted to, 2000, uh, to the present time, to 2022, um, a lot has changed in the world. Uh, a lot has changed in the world. Our scientific understanding of climate change has changed uh, dramatically. So on the left, you see some uh, features from the first uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report Assessment uh, in 1990, uh, which was quite tentative in its conclusions. Um, when they issued their first uh, assessment report, they emphasized the uncertainties in climate change science. Uh, they said that although warming to date was broadly consistent with models, it was also consistent with natural variability. Um, they couldn't say that, uh, they said that the ability to unequivocally detect human-induced warming was still a long way off. And contrast these statements from the first assessment report in 1990 uh, with the most recent assessment report, which the IPCC began to issue last year, the sixth assessment report. 
um, which said that it's unequivocal that human influence has warmed the climate at a rate unprecedented for 2,000 years, that human-induced climate change is already affecting many weather and uh, climate extremes uh, in every part of the world. Uh, the global surface temperature will continue to increase until at least mid-century under all emission scenarios considered, uh, and that many of these changes are irreversible for centuries to millennia. So much, much stronger scientific uh, outputs from the most recent assessment report compared to 1990. Technology has changed as well. So this is just showing the reduction in the price of solar modules um, over the last 45 years or so. A dramatic reductions in solar modules also uh, in the price of wind energy. Uh, the world has changed. Uh, among other changes, the attacks of 9-11 triggered the war on terrorism. Uh, China's economy has grown tremendously, increasing its political weight in the uh, international politics as well. Uh, in 1992, uh, many people described the world as unipolar, with the U.S. as the single hegemon. Today, I think we live very much in a multipolar world with uh, many different actors playing important roles. Uh, and domestic politics have changed, at least in the U.S., maybe less so in other countries. Uh, in 1992, uh, the climate change issue was not such a politically partisan issue. Uh, George H. W. Bush, the first President Bush, uh, vowed when he was running uh, for president that he would combat the greenhouse effect with the White House effect. Uh, the U.S. was the fourth country to ratify uh, the U.N. Framework Convention, and the resolution of ratification in the U.S. Senate uh, was adopted by voice vote, by consensus. Uh, so there was no opposition. I think today, in contrast, the partisan gap on climate change is huge. Uh, I think it would be very unlikely the Framework Convention could even be uh, approved at all in the U.S. Senate, much less by consensus. Um, I think it would be very, very hard to get two-thirds of the Senate uh, to vote in favor of any climate change agreement, uh, even one that doesn't involve significant commitments like the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. The partisan gap uh, on almost all aspects of the climate change issue now in the U.S. are huge as compared to 1992. So tremendous changes in science and technology and in international politics and domestic politics. Uh, but in fact, the climate change regime looks in many ways much the same as it looked back in 1992, despite all these changes. Uh, this is a slide that I used uh, when I first started presenting on climate change almost 30 years ago. And really, I can almost uh, use the same slide today uh, because the positions of most countries, uh, despite all these changes, are much the same. Um, so uh, the EU still uh, very much in favor of binding emission reduction targets. Uh, uh, they've, they've come around, I would say, I would need to modify the second uh, line here because they're much more accepting of market mechanisms. In fact, the EU emissions trading system is now the largest uh, trading system in the world. So my second line does require amendment here, so it's not exactly the same. Uh, U.S. is pretty much the same. Uh, concern about economic costs, number one priority. Want maximum flexibility in terms of how they would implement any kind of climate agreement. Uh, and the G77 in China, uh, they've changed to some degree, uh, but still resistant to any uh, notion that they have, uh, they should be having uh, emission reduction targets that are quantitative in nature, certainly against binding targets. Uh, still a focus primarily on, or a significant focus on financial and technological assistance. So positions are quite similar, maybe not exactly the same, but quite similar now as uh, 30 years ago. Uh, the issues in the negotiation are still the same ones that uh, were there 30 years ago. Uh, I wrote an article a couple of years ago called The Issues That Never Die, because these issues are ones that uh, have just been persistent throughout the entire 30-year history of the climate change regime. So the question of legal bindingness, to what degree should the, uh, issue, uh, the various provisions in the climate change regime be legally binding? A huge issue from day one in the negotiation, still a huge issue in the negotiation of the, Kyoto, uh, the Paris Agreement rulebook. Um, to what degree should the regime be top-down versus bottom-up? To what degree should it be prescribing rules through negotiations? Or to what degree should it be allowing countries to individually define uh, what they're going to do? Uh, and then the question of differentiation. Uh, how should the regime address uh, differences between developed and developing countries? Uh, to what degree should it have two categories of countries? To what degree which different kinds of provisions should be differentiated and which ones not? Uh, these three issues have dominated the negotiations from the beginning, and they still, I think, are key, critical in the negotiations today. 
And the responses to these haven't changed that much either. We have a brief detour during the Kyoto Protocol, but I'll come back to it in a minute. Um, to what degree should the regime be legally binding? The approach of the Framework Convention and the Paris Agreement is much the same. Uh, it's a treaty, but not all the provisions are legally binding, so it takes a uh, hybrid approach. Uh, to what degree should the regime be top-down versus bottom-up? Again, many similarities, I think, between the Framework Convention and the Paris Agreement. Both allow countries to nationally determine uh, what they're going to do. And on the issue of differentiation, again, with the Kyoto Protocol being the outlier, uh, I would say both the Framework Convention and the uh, Paris Agreement take a differentiated approach to the differentiation, where different uh, aspects of the regime were addressed differently in terms of how the degree of differentiation they involve. So uh, why has there not been so much progress on the climate change issue? Uh, why, you know, I can sometimes think you can close your eyes and if you're just listening, you wouldn't know whether it was 1992 or 2022, which meeting, whether you were at COP1 or you were at COP27, 20, uh, uh, if you just closed your eyes, because the, a lot of the things being said are much the same. So why hasn't there been more progress? Um, why has the issue been stuck? So. I think there are two reasons. Uh, one is the nature of the problem. It's what I think uh, uh, Ben might have been, Professor Ben might have been the first to describe it as a super wicked problem. It's, that uh, term is now used frequently uh, to describe the problem. Uh, so that's one reason. The other is that the climate change regime, I think, originally took the wrong path. It conceptualized the problem incorrectly and followed the wrong precedent uh, in terms of how it developed. So on the first issue, climate change is a super wicked problem. So this is my own characterization of what makes it super wicked. Uh, I call it a full Monty problem because it involves basically everything. Uh, all aspects of the economy either contribute to or are affected by climate change. It affects almost all aspects of domestic policy making, uh, uh, energy policy, transportation policy, agricultural policy, land use policy, urban policies, and so forth. Uh, it's a procrastination problem because we need to incur near-term costs for long-term benefits. Acting to reduce emissions costs money now uh, in return for uh, reductions in concentrations of greenhouse gases, reductions in warming, you know, many years in the future. And most people are uh, reluctant uh, to take action now to uh, achieve things far off in the future. Uh, it's a very complex and uncertain problem. Even today, with the science considerably more advanced than it was 30 years ago, there's still many, many uncertainties in the climate change uh, issue. Uh, if you read news reports, I think they often oversimplify what the IPCC says. And the IPCC reports are often much more nuanced and uh, modest in what they say uh, than the way they're sometimes characterized. Uh, it's a distributional problem because they're winners and losers. Uh, some countries are going to be devastated by climate change. Uh, other countries might actually come out ahead uh, and might improve their, uh, their weather conditions. Uh, I remember being in England one year, I don't think this is the view now, and they described uh, what climate change would do to England and they said it would, it would be much like uh, Italy or, uh, and people were saying this doesn't sound so bad. Uh, this actually uh, been mind living in, uh, in Italy. So, uh, uh, so they're gonna be, it's gonna affect different places in the world uh, differently. Um, it's an equity issue because uh, uh, some countries uh, are going to be, the ones that are most affected by climate change are the ones, the countries that have least contributed to the problem. So there's huge uh, equity issues. Um, it's, a, um, uh, it's an anarchy problem because there's no uh, international, strong international governance to be able to address it. Uh, and it's an immediate problem in that uh, if we really can't wait to take action every year we wait makes it that much more hard, difficult uh, to address the problem in the future. So just a hugely difficult problem. Now, the second reason I think the climate regime hasn't made as much progress is that it took for quite a long time uh, a wrong turn because I think it conceptualized the problem, the climate change problem incorrectly. Um, initially in dealing with climate change back in 1991 when I first got involved, uh, the Montreal Protocol, which was adopted in 1987, was the sort of latest thing, the, the, the brand new toy, uh, and it was very successful. Uh, the Montreal Protocol was extremely uh, successful in addressing the uh, ozone problem. This is showing the reduction in uh, consumption of ozone-depleting substances worldwide, and you can see the dramatic decreases in consumption of ozone-depleting substances. Uh, uh, many different causes for that, including technological changes, but I think most say that the Montreal Protocol played a significant role in that reduction. 
Um, so I think most people analogize climate change to the ozone problem and thought, let's do the same thing for climate change that we did for uh, the ozone problem. Um, uh, let's take the same approach. Now, uh, the ozone problem was conceptualized as a collective action problem, a prisoner's dilemma, uh, where each individual country has an incentive to use ozone su depleting substances, but then collectively, if they all use it, then uh, that'll deplete the stratospheric ozone layer. So you need to take joint action, joint action to reduce uh, use of ozone depleting substances. And how do you get uh, mutual agreement for each country to reduce uh, their use of ozone depleting substances? Uh, you use international agreements, you use a contractual model where there's a reciprocal exchange of commitments, where one country agrees to reduce its use of ozone depleting substances in return for other countries. And if you've got enough countries in saying, we're willing to commit to uh, reduce our re uh, use of ozone depleting substances, everyone comes out ahead. And the benefit, so it's based on reciprocity, it's based on one country agreeing to uh, do something in exchange for others. And the international agreement comes in in providing credibility so that if one country says they're going to do it in exchange for others, there's some credibility. The international agreement uh, helps establish uh, credible commitments in part by providing for transparency and verification, uh, in part in the ozone case by sanctioning defections if countries don't do what they say they're going to do. Um, so this is the approach taken in the Montreal Protocol. To conceptualize uh, the ozone problem, I think, correctly as a collective action problem, uh, and then having a contractual model for international law based on a reciprocal exchange of promises. So that was the approach to the Kyoto Protocol, uh, a contractual exchange of promises in the Kyoto Protocol where each country agreed to reduce its emissions uh, by a certain amount in exchange for other countries agreeing to reduce their emissions, at least this was among developed countries. Um, but I think the, I mean, so it is a collective action problem. So it's not incorrect that it's a collective action problem, but that's not really the way to conceptualize it in terms of what international law can do in response. Because I think it's even more a problem of domestic politics. So on the right, I have here a picture of Tip O'Neill, the former speaker of the US House of Representatives, whose most famous saying was, all politics is local. So even though climate change is an international problem that requires international, international action, the politics of climate change are still local, are still national. Because uh, as I said before, climate change implicates a country's entire economy. Uh, the changes that are gonna be required to deal with climate change, to reduce emissions, involve a country's energy policy, its transportation policy, its agricultural policy. Countries are very jealous of their sovereignty and don't wanna give up decision-making control over those fundamental aspects of their national policy. Um, they're going to be domestic winners and losers from climate policy. So again, uh, domestic politics comes into play. So most countries, I think, as a result in the climate change negotiations are not actually willing to do more in exchange for reciprocal promises by other countries. It's not that the U.S. is going to say, we'll reduce our emissions by 25%, but we'll, uh, uh, on our own, but if China agrees, we'll reduce by 40% or 50%. Uh, what the U.S. can do to reduce its emissions of climate change is based on what U.S. politics allows, uh, independently of what China does. And I think the same is true of other countries. Uh, I think very, at least my observation is India is not willing to do more to deal with climate change if China does more, if the U.S. does more, uh, it's gonna be driven by what India's domestic political situation is. So in that context, I think the contractual model where it's based on a reciprocal exchange of promises is not really the appropriate model that international, role that international law can play. So what are the alternatives? So one alternative is a prescriptive model of international law, where international law imposes obligations uh, on countries that may make some countries better off, some make some countries worse off. Uh, it doesn't depend on state consent. Uh, it just tells countries what to do, and then countries have to get in line uh, to do that. Um, I think the prescriptive model actually, and some here may disagree with this, but uh, prescriptive model underlies uh, the resort to courts, uh, because courts can rule on what the law is and say what, this is a very much a domestic law model, uh, where you think of uh, international laws like criminal law, it criminalizes or outlaws certain behaviors and then punishes violators, uh, and then people, uh, hope it will fall in line if the sanctions are sufficiently significant. Uh, I think the prescriptive model underlies the turn to courts uh, to deal with climate change because uh, negotiations aren't uh, proving sufficient. Uh, so we need somebody to say what the law is, uh, tell countries what they need to do. 
uh, and then the, the hope is that will then affect what countries, in fact, do do. Um, there's currently significant uh, momentum to bring a request for an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice so the International Court of Justice can pronounce on what international law requires of states with respect to climate change in the hope that that will then affect how states behave. I think the problem with the prescriptive approach here is that uh, international courts at least, national courts are different, uh, they can affect what national governments are doing, but international courts uh, are a very, very small uh, hammer to drive a very, very big nail. So it's a very, very, the very, very big nail here is state behavior. So you're trying to use a teeny weeny hammer here to try to drive a very big nail. And so I guess I'm skeptical of the ability of international courts to really significantly drive that nail and change state behavior with respect to what they do on climate change. So what are the alternatives? I think the alternative uh, is uh, what some people have described as a catalytic model or a facilitative model of international law where states have some willingness uh, to take action on their own. And the role of the international regime is to encourage a learning process uh, that changes perceptions of self-interest, that focuses international attention to empower domestic constituency, where transparency focuses uh, soft pressure on states, uh, and where there's assistance to states that want to do something but lack the capacity to do so. Uh, and I think this is the logic of the Paris Agreement. Uh, to generate a new logic of appropriateness by defining goals uh, for temperature and emissions uh, reductions, uh, to lock in domestic policies through this pledging and review process of nationally determined contributions, and to create political moments that focus public attention on the climate change issue, empower domestic constituencies, and catalyze more ambitious actions. So the Paris Agreement is essentially an attempt to find some middle ground between the Kyoto uh, uh, and Copenhagen approaches. Some people call it a Goldilocks solution because Kyoto uh, was uh, top-down, legally binding, uh, strong on rigor, but very weak on participation. Uh, Copenhagen was the other extreme, uh, very bottom-up, very weak, uh, very little rigor. Countries didn't own no discipline on what countries could do. Um, it was strong on participation, countries signed up to it, uh, but weak on rigor and ambition. And so the idea of Paris is to find some hybrid between these two uh, that combines uh, something that will attract significant participation, because that's key, you need countries to participate if you're going to affect change, uh, but also provides more rigor than Copenhagen. So let me just uh, describe quickly the Paris paradigm, uh, and I think it has five elements. Uh, it defines goals with respect to temperature, emissions, adaptation, and finance. Uh, it provides for a bottom-up pledging process through the nationally determined contributions. Uh, it uh, promotes uh, accountability through a, a, a fairly strong transparency mechanism. Um, it has an ambition cycle to promote stronger action over time, and it takes a nuanced approach to differentiation. So let me uh, run through each of these in a little bit more detail. So, first of all, first element of the Paris paradigm, establishing goals. Um, it establishes temperature goals of well below two degrees with an aspiration of 1.5 degrees. Emissions goal of peaking emissions as soon as possible and going to net zero sometime in the second half of the 20th, 21st century. Uh, an adaptation goal to build resilience and a finance goal to align financial flows with the other goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, it defines, secondly, a bottom-up pledging process through the nationally determined contributions. Each country can determine for itself, in accordance with its domestic circumstances, its domestic politics, uh, the type, scope, coverage of its mitigation contribution. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach like the Kyoto Protocol. It allows each country to craft its nationally determined contribution in accordance with what its domestic political process uh, allows. And the, NDCs are not legally binding. Uh, they're not legally binding. Instead of legal bindingness, the Paris paradigm uh, puts an emphasis on transparency as the mechanism to promote accountability. Uh, they follow a famous adage of the US uh, Justice of the Supreme Court, Louis Brandeis, uh, that, trans that sunlight is the best disinfected. Sunlight is the best disinfected. So if you sh shine light on what countries are doing, that's the best way to promote accountability that they'll do what they say they're going to do. Um, so uh, the transparency mechanism includes um, legally binding procedural obligations to provide information up front so it's clear what you're pledging to do. 
One of the problems with the Copenhagen process, it was like the Wild West. Countries could make pledges and you'd have no idea what the pledge meant because it didn't define what gases were covered, what sectors were covered, uh, didn't define what the baseline was for the reduction. So the, you had no idea what a country actually said it was going to do. Uh, so now under the Paris approach, uh, countries have to provide information that specifies their pledges in much more detail so it's clear what they're going to do. Uh, and then they have to do biennial reporting on what their emissions are and what kind of progress they made towards achieving their pledge in their NDC. Uh, so a lot more reporting requirements, both ex ante and ex post. And then various review mechanisms, including technical expert review, uh, peer review by states of one another's reports, and an implementation and compliance committee. So multiple levels of review, not super strong, I have to say, uh, but still a considerable amount of it. Uh, it was acknowledged when the Paris Agreement was uh, adopted that the initial round of NDCs of countries were not sufficient to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. That was accepted by countries. So the Paris Agreement builds in what's called an ambition cycle or a ratchet mechanism, the idea of which is to build ambition, strengthen the regime over time. So every five years, there's what's called a global stock take. Um, that reviews collective action and how the world is doing and achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement. And then countries go back every five years after the global stock take and come out with new NDCs, taking account of what the results of the stock take are. And so the idea of this is to focus attention every five years on how the world is doing. And then countries then come out with new NDCs against that backdrop, which in theory will be stronger and stronger over time. And the first of these global stock takes is currently underway and is supposed to wrap up uh, next year. The next round of NDCs would then be in 2025. Uh, and then finally, it takes a nuanced approach to differentiation. Um, it takes different approaches to differentiation for different aspects of the regime. So for mitigation, it establishes largely the same obligations for all countries, but countries get to define what they're gonna do themselves so they get to self-differentiate themselves. So if a country feels it's able to do more, um, it, uh, it can have a stronger NDC. If it feels it's not capable or responsible for doing more, it can have a weaker NDC. So countries get to self-differentiate what they're doing. Uh, on transparency, again, a common framework for all countries developed and developing, but then recognition that some countries lack capacity to be able to report in the same kind of detail as other countries. And so there's built-in flexibility for countries that lack capacity. Not all developing countries, but countries it's based on lack of capacity uh, that there's flexibility built in. And then finally for finance, uh, the same approach as before, which is a differentiated approach in the recognition that developed countries should be providing the financial support for developing countries. So that still is the one element uh, that's uh, fully differentiated. Um, so is the Paris paradigm, is this paradigm likely to work? So before I said things have uh, stayed much the same, but there have been some changes and I think the changes give one some reason to think that there might be uh, a better outcome coming out of the Paris uh, Agreement than before. Um, so these are four differences, I think, over the last uh, 30 years. Uh, the regime is now more global. Uh, the, the climate change issue is now more politically salient. Uh, there are more non-state actors involved in the process. And I think a closer US-China relationship, although that, I guess, is now more questionable than it was uh, until recently. So. First of all, more global. Um, so the UN Framework Convention was global and that everybody joined it, but it really didn't provide much in the way of obligations for developing countries. Really the only obligations that were significant, which were the reporting and review processes, only applied to develop, it really applied fully to developed countries. Paris Agreement, as I said, provides a similar structure really in most regards, except finance for all countries. So all countries have to uh, submit NDCs. They're subject to the same requirements about information up front to make clear what their NDCs are saying. Uh, they all have a common reporting requirements with some flexibility for some countries with lack of capacity, uh, similar review processes. So the fact that Paris is now universally accepted, I think is much more significant in sort of fully globalizing the regime uh, than the UN Framework Convention. Uh, secondly, the issue is much more politically salient, and i just give as an example of this uh, U.S. representation. So in the negotiation of the Framework Convention on Climate Change, the U.S. was represented by uh, Bob Reinstein on the left, who was a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, really, I think, third or fourth, depending on how many tiers you count at the State Department, third or fourth tier official. 
Uh, that was the head of the U.S. delegation. Now the U.S. delegation is headed by John Kerry, a former Secretary of State, former presidential candidate, almost became president of the U.S. Uh, he is a commanding, uh, Reinstein was a good negotiator, but he did not come have a global presence. He couldn't meet with heads of state. Uh, you know, he was a mid-level uh, career uh, civil servant. Uh, Bob Kerry, uh, John Kerry, a rock star internationally, uh, so, and this is reflective of a broader change. Uh, so, uh, at the Copenhagen Accord, a Copenhagen conference, the Copenhagen Accord was negotiated by 28 heads of state. Uh, and the picture on the top is showing a, a picture from that Copenhagen negotiation. So, the heads of state of uh, China, India, US, Germany, France, UK, all sitting around the table for really round the clock for more than a day. Uh, hammering out the Copenhagen Accord. And that extremely high level of tension, I think, reflects the greater political salience of the climate change issue generally in many, if not most countries. Uh, many, many more non-state actor initiatives. Uh, so beginning in 1980, uh, 2014, uh, the UN Climate Secretariat, under the direction of the uh, Peruvian and uh, French presidencies of the COP, uh, set up a, a, a website uh, a portal for listing non-state actor initiatives. So these are initiatives by businesses, by NGOs, by universities, by cities, by states. Um, and now that uh, climate action portal uh, includes almost 30,000 initiatives by non-state actors, reflecting just a huge uh, growth uh, in the activities of non-state actors in dealing with climate change. And this is now recognized in the regime itself uh, in the decision adopting the Paris Agreement. There are now two climate champions uh, who, uh, whose job is, who are uh, uh, under the uh, UN climate change regime framework, whose job is to coordinate and catalyze action by non-state actors to address climate change. And then, at least until very recently, and I think it's still unclear where it stands now on climate, a much closer US-Chinese relationship. Um, for much of the time I followed the negotiations, the U.S. and China was, were adversaries in the negotiations or had very different positions. But really, in the run-up to Paris, uh, U.S.-Chinese cooperation was, I think, critical for the success in Paris in adopting the Paris Agreement. Uh, the U.S. and China met uh, several times at very high levels pre-Paris and came out with communiques that really, I think, laid the groundwork uh, for the Paris Agreement. Many of the actual issues in Paris and the negotiations uh, were worked out in the so-called G2 between the US and China and then basically given to the president and then other countries um, more or less accepted them. Um, so the US-Chinese relationship has been key, I think, uh, in making the regime more productive. Uh, where it stands now, I think, is uh, open to question given the deterioration of US-Chinese relationships. But even in Glasgow last year, uh, U.S. and China came out with a joint declaration mid, in the middle of the second week, which was very um, positive, including announcements dealing with reductions in methane uh, that really energized the second week. Uh, the second week of the COP in Glasgow was a bit in the doldrums, and the U.S.-China declaration uh, showing that the U.S.-Chinese relationship on climate change was still going strong, I think, was, was important. Now, uh, this last year, things have uh, gone south even further, so it's a little unclear where it stands. Uh, but I understand there's still uh, active uh, discussions between the U.S. and China on climate change. So Glasgow last year was the first real test of the Paris paradigm. Uh, the first three years after Paris was adopted were taken up negotiating the rule book, and then 2020 was going to be the year of ambition. Uh, to see whether countries came out with stronger NDCs, but then due to COVID, uh, they couldn't hold the COP in 2020. So last year in 2021 was really the first uh, test because the idea of Paris was Paris is supposed to provide a driver for countries to come back with stronger NDCs over time and increase their ambition and close the gap between what countries are doing now and what they need to do in order to keep temperature increased to below one and a half degrees. So Glasgow outcomes, um, there were more ambitious NDCs. Uh, they closed the emissions gap somewhat, but only by about 15 to 17 percent, according to Climate Action Tracker, which is an NGO that calculates this. Uh, many countries came out with net zero um, pledges, uh, representing about three quarters of global emissions, so a huge number of, well, uh, countries representing a huge proportion of global emissions came out with mid-century, more or less mid-century net zero pledges. 
Um, there were side deals on uh, methane, uh, on finance, on forests, on cars. Um, so a variety of side deals announced in Glasgow. And then finally, the Glasgow Climate Pact, uh, which among other things said they would revisit NDCs this year, those that are not aligned with the um, one and a half degree temperature goal. So is Glasgow half uh, empty or half full as some uh, uh, jokers have uh, quipped? Uh, this is not my, uh, my pun. Uh, is it half full or half empty? So I think it really much depends on one's perspective. So John Kerry uh, described it, we emerged closer to achieving our goals than ever before. Uh, uh, Greta Thunberg described it as blah, blah, blah. So quite different assessments of the Glasgow outcomes. So in the last uh, few minutes of my talk, I want to just provide my own report card. So I have to just preface this by saying these are completely subjective grades. Uh, they have no objective basis. Uh, and I'm really grading, there was no mandatory curve. So I've really, there's some great inflation here perhaps. Uh, but this was my attempt to try to summarize uh, a little bit where we are in the climate change issue. So I've, I've um, done it in terms of some of the catalytic logic that I think the Paris Agreement is supposed to reflect. So shaping normative expectations, creating political moments, uh, progressively increasing ambition over time, uh, providing financial support, climbing, addressing climate justice, and reducing emissions. Okay, so shaping expectations, I give it an A. I'm giving it an A because I think the Paris Agreement has been actually remarkably successful in shaping expectations. Uh, 1.5 degrees, which was really just put forward by island states originally and very reluctantly included at all, uh, and uh, has now become really the global benchmark as to where the world needs to head. And you can see this in some of the signs below, but I think it's also in the reporting of the issue and even what the countries talk about now, 1.5 degrees has become the de facto goal. Uh, what was uh, a uh, uh, target of getting to net zero in the second half of the century, um, which was what the Paris Agreement provides for, really now is a mid-century. So before it was 2050 to 2100 as the target date when you were supposed to be trying to get to net zero. Now really the uh, benchmark is 2050. Uh, China was 2060, India was 2070, but most countries that have put forward net zero pledges, it's mid-century, so that goal has been moved up as well. Uh, and I think there's broad agreement uh, on these goals uh, now within the international community. So uh, if you had asked me six years ago, seven years ago, would there be general agreement on 1.5 degrees as the goal, as the global goal, I would have said, you know, very, very unlikely. Uh, but the Paris Agreement, uh, I think has been uh, surprisingly successful in shaping sort of what the expectation is as to what the world needs to be. Now, whether they'll get there or not, totally different question, but at least it provides a benchmark against which you can assess what countries are doing and criticize what countries are doing as being insufficient. I'm um, creating political moments. Uh, I think the Paris Agreement, even before the Paris Agreement, but it's continued, the climate change regime generally has been successful in creating political moments. Um, I call this now a tale of two cops because the cop originally was a meeting of the parties to the uh, various agreements, the UN Framework Convention initially and then the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement. Um, so there still are meetings of the parties, but they're really, I don't think, like any other meeting of the parties of other agreements or there very few agreements are like this because they become really mega events every year involving tens of thousands of people and their trade fairs, their political summits because the heads of state go. There are huge media events, you know, thousands and thousands of reporters there. Uh, there are forums for NGOs and academia, there are networking opportunities. Um, so I call this a tale of two cops because the cop really, there's a little part of the cop that's actually the meeting of the parties with the official agenda. And then there's the mega cop uh, where most of the people there are pretty much unaware of what's going on in the official agenda. They're there for other purposes. Uh, so. Um, and you can see this in the participation uh, level. So uh, now in the early COPs, you know, the participation was in the low thousands. Now it's routinely in the tens of thousands. And Glasgow was the most attended COP um, in history, uh, even though it was held in the midst of COVID. And even though the UK government had quite restrictive policies in terms of proving vaccination status in order to be able to go in the first place. Um, in terms of ratcheting up NDCs and net zero targets, so I give it a B, and if I'm really feeling generous, B plus. Uh, 
because uh, quite a few countries actually did come forward ultimately with uh, new uh, or updated NDCs in the run-up uh, to the Glasgow and at the meeting itself of Glasgow. Um, uh, countries uh, have also come forward with net zero pledges. Uh, a lot of them aren't really backed up yet with any legal basis, uh, but they're at least uh, setting some political benchmark uh, against which you can assess what governments are doing. Uh, and these pledges now represent about three quarters of global emissions. So three quarters of the countries representing three quarters of global emissions have pledged to get to net zero by 2050 or thereabouts, China 2060, as I said, and India 2070. Um, and uh, this has actually produced, according to Climate Action Tracker, uh, expectations of significantly less climate change, significantly less temperature increase than previously thought. In the period going into Paris, temperature increase was high twos up to three. Uh, now, as a result of the pledges uh, pre-Glasgow and Glasgow, the net zero pledges and so forth, really on the most optimistic scenario, if everything goes right, uh, Climate Action Tracker estimates increase of 1.8 degrees, actually below the two degree target. Again, uh, now of course, this depends on countries actually implementing their pledges, you know, so many, many big question marks, many, many big question marks as to whether uh, these pledges are really gonna be meaningful. But I think again, if you would ask most people uh, seven years ago, would countries be making pledges that would keep us under two degrees? I think most people would have said, no, no way, because most people, uh, at least most people I knew, Maybe I was talking to the real pessimists, but uh, most people I knew thought there was no way countries could possibly achieve the, the two degree target. Uh, they thought we were you know, at least at two and a half degrees warming. Um, so the fact that countries have uh, said they're gonna uh, uh, do things that will keep temperature to below two degrees, I think is, is significant. So certainly not an A, we're still a long, long way from one and a half degrees, but uh, a lot better than we were uh, 10 years ago, uh, assuming countries actually do what they say they're going to do. Um, I'm giving a little extra credit here for the methane pledge, like a shout out to the methane pledge, because methane is an extremely potent greenhouse gas. So if you can actually bring methane down, uh, then uh, it will have a very quick impact on the climate. Uh, some of these take a long time to uh, take effect because carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has a very, very long atmospheric lifetime. But methane comes out of the atmosphere much more quickly. So if you can bring down what you're putting into the atmosphere, then the stuff that's being drawn down by the atmosphere, uh, taken out of the atmosphere isn't being replaced. And since that is having a huge global warming effect, you can affect temperature more quickly. So methane pledge, I think, was big again. Uh, as with a lot of these things, lots of uncertainties. How the methane pledge fits into the Paris framework, um, uh, what kind of transparency provisions will there be to actually assess what the pledge means and whether countries are achieving the pledge, whether the pledge will be essentially double counting and because it will be already included in NDCs or represent something additional to NDCs. These are all things uncertain, So, uh, but I think still uh, we should give some credit for it. Uh, providing support, um, I'm going to give a generous grade here of C+. Some people would give an F here, some people would give an F here, but uh, the pledge was in, uh, so it depends how you measure it, the pledge was uh, mobilizing $100 billion uh, from private and public sources by 2020 per year. Uh, they got to about $80 uh, billion, so they got 80% of the way there. So my understanding is, I don't know, people can tell me if I'm wrong, that 80% mark is usually a passing grade. So I'm going to give it a passing grade uh, because an 80, uh, I don't believe, is a failing grade. But uh, I don't know the grading system here in Singapore. So you can correct me. Uh, loss and damage, uh, I'm going to give it a C. Again, some people would give it a failing grade. But I'm going to give it a C because I think loss and damage, I'm surprised they've gotten anywhere on loss and damage. Um, international agreements are generally premised on joint gains. Everybody has to come out ahead because you won't agree if you're going to come out behind. Uh, so uh, uh, loss and damage is not an issue where everybody comes out ahead. It's a distributional issue where some countries are going to have to pay money to other countries to compensate them for damages they've suffered as a result of climate change. Um, I think it's very rare that international agreements provide for significant redistribution of resources because the countries that are losing the resources, that are the ones giving the resources, um, uh, 
have, you have to make some rationale for why they're going to come out ahead, even though they're giving up resources. So I had extremely, extremely low expectations. So this is against my expectations on any progress on loss and damage. I think it's a key issue, so I'm not trying to minimize the issue, but I just think it's one that the kind of catalytic logic that I was talking about of the Paris paradigm really doesn't apply to. So the fact that they made any progress on it, I think is uh, impressive, actually. Uh, impressive, and they have made some progress. Uh, there's quite a lot of discussion now. It's really been elevated in terms of the priority on the agenda at the COPs. Um, so I would give it a C as still a work in progress, though. Um, and then finally, uh, limiting emissions, which of course is the uh, ultimate test. Uh, I'm giving it an incomplete because we don't really know yet uh, how Paris is going to work. Uh, the NDCs don't apply till 2030, so it's still eight years away. The mid-century uh, net zero pledges don't apply till 2050. Um, still, I think, too early to say whether or not uh, that upward curve of emissions, which has been unrelenting, uh, is going to start to bend and come down again. So that, of course, is the big uh, question. So. Um, so let me just conclude saying that after 30 years, I think still very much an open question whether the regime is going to work or not. I'm not giving up on it yet. Uh, I think there have been some hopeful developments uh, over the last 30 years, even though progress has been excruciatingly slow, uh, particularly for those of us who got to live through those 30 years uh, involved in the negotiations. Uh, according to um, uh, most projections, in order to keep climate change uh, within relatively acceptable bounds, we'll need to decarbonize the global economy in the next 30 years. A huge task, decarbonize. So we spent 30 years getting to only modest progress so far, so hopefully the next 30 years we'll see much more significant progress to deal with the problem. So the next 30 years really needs to, I think, focus on implementation uh, rather than just continuing this endless process of negotiations. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. So our moderator for today is Ms. Daniel Yao. Daniel is an adjunct senior research fellow and leads on climate change law and policy issues at CIL. Daniel's experience spans across a range of public international law issues, including trade and investment, environment and climate change, and international security. In her previous role, she had advised and represented the Singapore government at international negotiations and dispute resolution and was lead counsel in a number of negotiations at the bilateral, regional, and multilateral levels, including at the climate change meetings. She was formerly an alternative member of the Paris Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee. Dr. Linda Celestiawati is a senior research fellow at the NUS Asia Pacific Center for Environmental Law. She is also an associate professor of law in Universitas Gajah Mada. Linda was a member of a delegation leading Indonesia's negotiations of the Paris Agreement and was a lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Sixth Assessment Report from 2018 to 2021. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much uh, to Raila. Thanks very much, uh, Professor Dan Daniel, for that really magisterial survey, I would say. Uh, I hope you all agree with me. It's a really fantastic survey and there's so much I learned. And it's my privilege to be here, uh, to be moderating this discussion with Nilofer and uh, Linda and yourself. So thank you very much. Uh, very inspiration to think also about the four-stage process. I've actually taken inspiration from that in my class as well. Uh, so it was fantastic to hear that. So before, so I'd like to start with this moderation by giving an opportunity to, Lind, to Linda and first to Nilifer, you can start us off. For your response to what Daniel has mentioned, do you agree with his gradation of, <laughs> of the success and the failure? Uh, you know, I, I heard some gas of, you know, of, 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 of responses from the audience and some some of the responses I think I, I would be very happy to hear from Nilifer and then Nilda if you could share as well your responses particularly from the ASEAN region which you're so familiar with as well you know what would be your reaction to what Daniel has mentioned vis-a-vis -vis the journey so far so Nilifer over to you thank you uh, thank you so much Danielle and uh, I fully agree with you that this was really an absolutely fantastic presentation uh, by Dan. Um, I think we really got a very clear um, overview of the last 30 years 
and really made things um, encapsulated uh, the issues, the progress, very well. So I really have to congratulate and thank you as well. Um, in terms of, uh, and what I, I did appreciate is that the contrast, when you look at the 30 years, that yes, the climate is changing, but I, th I really thought Dan did a wonderful job in showing how the difference in our knowledge of science has changed, global politics has changed, so it's not just the climate changing, but many things have changed. But the point you made about the government's, <laughs> the negotiation positions have not. Um, and, and so I realized that perhaps, maybe we do have to th not always look at the glass being half empty. And I think um, the presentation by Dan today really tried to make us look at slightly more positive, not completely negative in terms of where we are. Um, so in the sense that I would agree that, you know, Paris did create, I guess you call it the catalytic model. I may be, I may be not be as confident as you are that that is actually going to move things forward enough, but I think there is no other choice. I mean, I think that in terms of getting governments on board, that was the only way. Um, so when it comes to the prescriptive model, uh, and I do understand your point on the international level, and I'm not going to address that, but I think domestic is key. I'm beginning to think more and more, and we, we haven't talked about that, the, the climate litigation that has just taken off like wildflower, uh, wild, wildfire at the domestic level. And so I may look at that as actually providing more action um, than the catalytic model in that, in that sense. So I may have a slightly different view on that. Um, but I do agree that the 1.5 degree is a huge advancement because the convention itself, Article 2, was pretty, it was hard to really, it didn't really give you quantification. Um, and that we do see a big change. There is much more momentum, and the big change is coming from non state actors, from civil society, young people. So there, there, there is optimism, and, and I think the numbers I have, I would like to talk to you more about those, the one. 0.8 degree centigrade, how that's calculated. So overall, um, I think it was, you know, I, I, I agree with the approach. I thought it was very illuminating and it makes us think uh, as well. So I'll just stop there. Thank you very much, Nilfa. Um, thank you. Linda, over to you. Uh, thank you, um, Danielle and CIL and Absal to have invited me to, uh, as a discussant for this forum. I'm totally trying to play, playing it cool of fangirling to Prof. Berdinsky. <laughs> I quoted you more times than I can remember, uh, Dan. So, um, yeah. Um, so, but, but, yeah. I would like to uh, uh, beg for an appeal of the greats, I think. Uh, from ASEAN, I think mostly uh, 10 of us, like at least eight of us are developing countries. And um, the fact that the 100 billion that they promised in 2020 didn't, didn't even uh, get to any of uh, us until 2022, maybe 2023, we never know. Um, I think you have to give it an F, I, I suppose, rather than a C. Um, because as developing countries, uh, I think uh, we need that support more than anything else. Um, and the fact that we're not the one who started uh, climate change, although now we're also contributing to climate change, um, we need that to be materialized as soon as possible, which then leads me to my second point, Danielle, is on um, loss and damage. I also think we need to get an F on that. Uh, loss and damage is not a new issue. We have discussed this since Warsaw. Um, COP21, COP23, we have a task force, as, as, as Dan has mentioned, there's like a lot of discussion on it, uh, but yet it has not gone anywhere in Glasgow. It, you know, it just panned down. And, 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 and the fact that, you know, it's a loss and damage is like a kind of insurance for states that are suffering from climate change. Uh, and mostly these are like states that, you know, uh, didn't, didn't start climate change, but they have to uh, face the consequences because 
they're the poorest of the poor, uh, and, and they didn't get any help uh, yet. So I think um, if, you know, if, we were, if we want to be honest, we need to you know, get a slap on the face and say, hey, you know, wake up, uh, developed states, uh, you need to help you know, these uh, developing states, because if not, who's going to help us? We don't know, right? Um, and then um, on a third point, Daniel, I think uh, uh, what we're trying to say here is that so far the Paris regime then is trying to get all the states on board, right? Agreed on things that they want to do. But it's not really pushing them on doing what they want to do. So they agree on it and they might do it, they, don't, they probably won't. So it's, um, it's harder on, on developing states too. Like it gives us the dilemma that we, we didn't want to even face. Like for example, Indonesia, I came from Indonesia, right? Um, <clears throat> we had a long, a long uh, letter of intent between Indonesia and Norway on, on red, red plus, uh, for, for, for $1 billion. And then last year, the government of Indonesia decided since there were just too many requirements and Norway is not giving the money uh, yet, like it's giving like 20 or 30% out of the $1 billion, they decided to walk out, right? And on the other hand, if you look at coal, Indonesia is number two coal exporter in the world. And how much do we get from coal? $36 billion in six months. I am not kidding. So this is like the dilemma that are faced by developing countries. And if like developed countries are, you know, not going to look at us, we are still going to use all these, you know, uh, black, gray, whatever resources we have. You know, net zero would be on paper, yes. But like in reality, it will be sad. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Nilufa, and thanks very much, uh, uh, Linda, for sharing your perspective. It seems to me there are two kind of, there are a couple of overarching themes. First is, of course, in terms of the normative agenda. Uh, Dan has said that they've done well. Countries have on paper agreed to certain things. Nilufa, I think you agree with me that the, the, the emphasis now on 1.5 was a bit of a, a, a sea change. Um, and we saw that really in Glasgow. Before Glasgow countries would say, so, well, you know, it's too well, 1.5 is by the side. But now 1.5 is, 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 is at least the benchmark as you described. And that's where I think on paper we've done well. But on the flip side, Linda has, has described that very well in terms of where we are and what needs to be done. So with that, um, we overlay that with the third theme, which is really the geopolitics and you know, current security situation, which is impacting um, uh, the reality of the US-China relations on the one part, and also the reality of energy transition um, and what countries are in reality forced to have to do to survive the winter, so to speak, because of energy and uh, fuel shortage. So the question here, and this links with some of the questions that has come through, and you have described it as a super wicked problem. So when we have a super wicked problem, I wonder if there are Avengers fans here. I know, where is the super Avengers? Where is the team? What needs to be done? Uh, are we heading towards a situation of the snap? Again, only for those who are Avenger fans. You know, are we heading in a situation where something dramatic has to really happen? Some terrible global tragedy which is waiting around the corner before anybody will sit up? And what are the priorities you think has to be in place for COP? For the next two COPs, one taking place in Africa, one taking place in the Middle East, where the priorities may be quite different from what we have seen so far. So maybe Dan, you'd like to start us off on that. Working? Okay. Um, so just first of all, I want to clarify that I'm not, I wouldn't characterize myself as optimistic that Paris is going to work. I guess I'm reserving judgment as to whether Paris is going to work. I haven't given up on Paris, uh, but I think it's very much an open question whether it will work because, as Danielle says, most of what's been done so far is on paper. So countries have said they're going to have certain NDCs. They said they're going to have net zero targets. Most of the calculation that Climate Action Tracker does it gets you down to 1.8 degrees, assumes perfect implementation by all countries at what they, the maximum of what they said they're going to do. So it applies, uh, so it's very unlikely 
at the moment at least in practice, that 1.8 degrees will be achieved. So uh, on the other hand, I think there are some, it has had some effect. So I, I think it's too early to say, because things can change, uh, that uh, whether or not there will be strong implementation of weather, those density recoveries will lead to changes in domestic politics that eventually lead to changes in what countries are emitting. So I think it's, I, I, all I'm saying is if the choices are uh, true believer in Paris, completely uh, giving up on Paris, I'm somewhere in the middle. Uh, definitely not a true believer, but I am not giving up. I think it's, and that's why I think in terms of alternatives, uh, you know, we need to be very cautious about alternatives because uh, it seems to me that Paris is still our best hope. Uh, no, it's still something difficult. Uh, so that's just the first comment I want to make. And then just a second just comment is uh, loss and damage has been really on the agenda since 1991 when I first started following the issue because uh, back in 1991 during the negotiation of the Framework Convention, small island states were arguing for establishing uh, an insurance mechanism to provide insurance against uh, uh, damages due to climate change. So it's been on the agenda for 30 plus years now. Uh, I usually liken the negotiations to uh, uh, trench warfare. So uh, you uh, advance inches forward, and then you're pushed back an inch, and then you advance another three inches. Uh, and that's sort of the way the negotiations have gone on many issues, uh, I think including loss and damage. But I guess, so again, it depends on, against the standard of actual, actual action on loss and damage, completely agree with you. Uh, there's been very little actual action on loss and damage. In terms of this process of the trench warfare, actually, I think vulnerable states and small island states have made significant progress, first in getting the Warsaw Mechanism established in, in Warsaw in uh, 2013, uh, then in uh, establishing the, um, uh, oh, the, uh, the dial, the, um, I'm forgetting the name, the, the network that's looking at it. Well, anyway, uh, so, so, and now there's uh, discussions of finance for loss and damage, which really would have been uh, several years ago completely off the table as even a topic for discussion, and now there's an active dialogue. So these things advance very slowly, so I can totally understand frustration and how slowly they move, but I think they are actually moving incrementally, you know, inch by inch, uh, so that's why I gave it. And I, and I, and I guess my starting point was probably zero progress because for a long time there was zero progress. So I guess I think that's why you're going to see uh, just my way of defending the grade. But uh, I'm prepared to, I'm not going to defend it very hard. Uh, so on the question of sort of the larger political situation, so I think this is one of the problems that climate change is a big priority uh, for many people, for countries, but there are a lot of other priorities to it because climate change affects so many different things like energy security, like being able to keep, get sufficient heat in the winter, that in fact, when push comes to shove and the crunch, you know, it drops down the policy agenda so that uh, now, given the war in Ukraine and the shortage of fuel in Europe and so forth, uh, even European states, which have been relatively forward-leaning on the climate change issue, you know, when it really comes down to it, it's not the number one priority. So, so I think this is a big problem. And, uh, um, and I think it makes it even harder to make progress on the climate change issue. And uh, uh, that's why I think it's, it's a big problem. Thanks. Thanks very much, Daniel. I mean, it, indeed, it is a, a huge problem, a political problem. And I suppose I'd like to hear from, from Nilfer and, and Leo on this as well, because a lot of st stock has been put on what governments can do, what the policies are, what the problem of domestic politics impinging on, uh, you know, you have politicians, for example, in the US, very polarized, is being kicked around as a political football. So the question really is, I mean, the science is clear, but how do we make the science real? And I think that's a question. How do we make it real to the individuals on the ground? What is the role of civil society, the businesses, for example, uh, that would actually bring the message to those who can actually reflect the message back to the, to the political leaders or the policy makers, so to speak? Uh, and, and coming back to your question on the tale of two costs, uh, how can they influence the priorities in 27 and 28? Uh, Nelifa, would you like to start us off? Yeah, that's a very good, oops, that's a good 
Yeah, that's the big challenge, to be quite honest. Um, and I think I have less faith in the governments, although that's where, of course, the decisions are made. And we are, in a, I think, in a perfect storm of terrible leadership in the world right now, frankly, in many ways. We, you know, Trump is no longer president, but he certainly inflicted damage in withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. We have, I mean, maybe I shouldn't be naming countries, but <laughs> right now, you know, the UK, Prince Charles can't go to COP. <laughs> I mean, it's very symbolic for what that means. In other countries, we have the Ukraine-Russia war. So all of these things um, um, bode rather ominously for um, hitting that net zero target, frankly, if we're looking right now. Um, but having said that, and, and trying to take a more positive, I'm not saying you're positive, but I think it is important not to dwell solely on you know, everything that's wrong and negative because we won't get any action. I have much more faith in non-state actors because I think and, and that's where really movement is. That includes business as well, and that's, they're very important. Um, I think we have been seeing a lot more action there, um, and also because people, I mean, this has been going on for some years, where, um, shall we say, enlightened uh, people are becoming more active as maybe stockholders, um, so really trying to push more pro-climate agendas. I mean, not, I'm not an expert in this, but, so, but I think it is important Youth, very important voice. You had the Greta, of course, the blah, blah, but I think that's how young people feel. Um, and they're certainly the ones who are going to bear truly the brunt uh, of climate change. So I think change and the, the, the domestic litigation, change is going to come, it is bottom up, but I think it will come much more um, from non-government entities and will force governments. I mean, let alone governments are not going to do it. I have absolutely you know, little faith in that. Um, so, but my optimism would be coming from people, basically. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Linda? Thanks. Um, so, I think bringing the message to the local levels is important. Uh, I agree with all the uh, previous speakers. Uh, mostly, in uh, my experience, it's lost in translation when we're talking to the local uh, level, whether it is the government or Mostly just, you know, lay people like farmers or um, um, uh, people who are living on the land. So I did a research back in 2019 where um, Indonesia already had a national action plan on climate change. But, you know, based on, you know, like a, like a sweep of all the local governments in Indonesia, there were only four or five local governments that already have climate change regulation within their localities, which is very sad. Indonesia has 548 local governments, so huge, right? Uh, I'm hoping like, if we do another research in 2023, there'll be more numbers in there. Uh, but mostly uh, what, what I found that worked during that time, like a few years ago, 2019, is that the, the regulations is not on climate change, but it's on, for example, insurance for farmers against flood, against fire, against uh, uh, landslides. So these are, you know, these are the day-to-day -day things that they faced, and they didn't necessarily understand that it's in correlation to climate change, right? But that's, you know, that's what's happening uh, specifically in the local level. So implementation uh, is also another hurdle uh, for, for climate change because it's just, it's just so massive, you don't know where to start, right? Uh, but, but yeah, uh, but I agree with, with, with Dan and with Nilofer that uh, we have to start somewhere. And also, um, yeah, the NSA, the non-state actor, has been working really well not just in developed countries, but also in developing countries. We've seen youth uh, groups, green groups everywhere, although uh, also ironically, ironically, these youth groups have meetings in cafes and, and, and drinking in plastic cups, right? <laughs> I'm just, you know, dudes. Uh, 
And then using laptops that are made in China by child laborers, I don't know. But, you know, but at least they, they are trying to do something which is commendable. Um, and then the, the fourth thing is climate litigation, uh, not just in developed countries, but also in developing countries. We've seen this in Pakistan, in, in India, in, in Nepal, you know, hopefully soon in ASEAN also. Uh, maybe not in Singapore, but in Indonesia and in the Philippines, there are something boiling that I think um, uh, 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 litigants uh, have the courage to ask their governments to, you know, do what you promised to do. Thank you. Thanks very much, Linda, for bringing us to the point of climate litigation, which I think quite be an interesting one for, 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 for those in the audience as well. Because there, there are two sides to climate litigation. One of which is, of course, pushing governments in a certain direction. The second part, of course, is, is for some governments, it may seem as a form of activism and impingement into a kind of a policy space uh, and could. And in fact, what you also see, perhaps not in the environmental space, but in the trade and investment space, you find investors pushing back, um, uh, launching you know, investor state disputes. Recently, we just talked about it, I believe, um, in one of our discussions. Um, and that can cause regulatory trail as well. So it's a little bit of a difficult balance, I would say. Um, from my perspective, it has two roles, but we'll be very careful how they're approached. Um, and, and really we have, as you say, pending actions probably coming up more in Asia. Um, we have this always discussion of this international litigation or advisory opinions that may be coming out as well. So what, what are your thoughts on that, uh, on that approach? from that perspective. So that's one, maybe Nilifer, you'd like to, to take that question um, on the prospects of litigation and actually moving the agenda. And maybe it might, it might the effect might differ, it might be different in different countries. I was just wondering about your thoughts about that. Um, and perhaps I will leave that question with you first, Nilifer. Okay, thank you. Because I know that uh, Linda and Absol have done a big report uh, on this. But just very briefly, um, I've been, it started off with one case, the Urgande case, uh, the Netherlands, and it has just taken off. I think we were just talking recently, there are now some 800 cases pending. And, I, and absolutely, Linda, I think what's critical is that it's not just developed countries, developing countries, we're seeing these litigation. Um, and, and it really, um, it's accountability. How to make governments and states accountable. Um, and there are limits, and, and even though we have nuanced differences with Dan on the question of international level, but, but uh, the impact from domestic directly on governments is, is, is going to be far more fully agree than a, a, any advisory opinion, of course, would be, uh, or even a contentious case at the international uh, court level. Um, so I, I think that um, the, the domestic uh, climate litigation is very significant. Um, and even if, and when we talk about the international level, I mean, states don't want to be. It's interesting to me, I find it somewhat paradoxical that states will negotiate to minimize as much as possible any uh, semblance of legal uh, responsibility under international treaties. And yet, you really don't see that many uh, cases going to international courts. Um, uh, on these, and because it is consent-based, except of course we have the Law of the Sea Convention, which there's some more uh, avenues available. But at the other hand, I, what, what I see at the international level, it is drawing attention. The Vanuatu Initiative, um, the small island developing states, the Pacific region, uh, they have really have, they have really emerged with, as leaders in the climate change field. And I think this is one more avenue of leadership on their part to take it to the ICJ, uh, or at least create that whole momentum. And, and there's a lot of talk and discussion going on about this. Uh, we still don't know what the question is. That's very critical. Uh, the question is absolutely critical to know um, what, what this um, strategy is a good one or not. But for me, I think we have to use all tools available. And, and I just want to say one thing. We just did, if I make a plug for CIL, we have now our CIL Dialogues blog. And our first blog was on climate change. And the question was, 
um, uh, clim uh, climate change in an unequal world, does international law matter? And I think it's very important. How do we make international law relevant? Um, so I think this is something that we need to contemplate as well. Thanks very much, uh, for that. Daniel, if, 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 if you have a comment on that, I'd be very, very interested in your thoughts. Uh, but can I also leave a question with you? And this is also related to the question from the audience. Um, and broadly to do with this, to the role of where private enterprise businesses come in. The specific question is, what do you think of the utilization of green bonds? Do you think they'll be effective? And I suppose the larger question is really the role of finance, uh, climate finance from a more business perspective rather than the, the, the 100 billion that we're talking about. But also wrapped up with that is a question, the whole question of greenwashing. And it was a huge big topic, but I'm quite interested in your views on that. And how do you think this will aid the agenda? Thanks for the question. So on climate litigation, I think I Climate litigation, I would distinguish between three different types of litigation. So there's international litigation, uh, which would be against states. There's there's more than these three kinds, but let me just highlight three. There's national litigation against governments, and then there's uh, national litigation against corporations. So uh, and in all these three cases, I think the judicative model is the prescriptive model, where you want a court to tell whoever the defendant is what they need to do. Uh, so I guess I'm a little skeptical, as I said in my talk, about uh, international litigation against states because I think international courts have limited ability to affect uh, state behavior. Um, I think national courts have, uh, in some countries, and it varies very much from country to country, but in some countries national courts do have uh, significant power, uh, either over states or against corporations or both. So I think the prescriptive model can be productive uh, in the national context. Um, I think that against governments, it very much does depend on the country involved as to whether courts have the power to be able to tell countries, or the government, what they need to do. And I think one question is, I think there's uh, national litigation uh, is important, but I think if you, you would want to add up all the countries where you think national litigation might be successful and what proportion of global emissions does that account for. And I think it would be a minority of global emissions where you have a judicial system where the court could really tell a government or is likely to tell a government what to do uh, on climate change. I think that's extremely unlikely, for example, in the US uh, against the government. So I think it's important. I think uh, I totally agree with Nilofer. We should pursue all avenues, even if it's only maybe accounting for 20% of global emissions or you have countries where the judiciary has that capacity. That's the whole 20%. That's very important. Um, I think actually where there may be even more scope, though, for judicial action is in uh, uh, cases against corporations, because if you can get uh, judicial orders against multinationals that have operations worldwide, uh, then you can potentially affect their operations globally. Uh, and so I think uh, the potential for climate litigation against private actors, against companies, uh, is something you know that also needs to be emphasized. In terms of uh, the role of business and the role of non-state action, I uh, totally agree with Nilifer that that's an important new dimension of climate action. I was trying to highlight that a little bit in one of my slides. Um, I do think, though, there's a significant question, just as there's skepticism as to whether countries are going to implement their NDCs or their net zero pledges, I think there's a significant question as to whether or not all of these different corporate pledges are actually going to be implemented and what they mean. And I think actually something that requires much more attention is establishing some system for monitoring, uh, verifying, corporate report uh, pledges that sort of parallels the kind of process we have for states. We have a quite elaborate system now for the information states have to include when they make their NDCs so that it's clear what their NDC means for reporting on progress in achieving one's NDC. There's nothing comparable with respect to pledges by companies or private actors for what they're going to do. And I think that's really essential because I think there are 20 some uh, between 25 and 30,000 pledges up there on the climate action portal of the UNFCC means, but there are no requirements as to actually what your pledge uh, includes. Uh, and so to determine whether those pledges are meaningful or not, I think is a really key question if you're focusing on the business sector. On the green bonds question, I'm just going to have to plead that uh, I'm an international lawyer rather than an international finance person, <laughs> so that's really beyond my areas of expertise. Uh, but I think finance, though, plays a critical role. Uh, uh, but exactly what financial instruments are going to be most effective. I, yeah. Thanks very not much. something I'm an expert on. No, thanks very much for that, Daniel. I appreciate that. I mean, certainly in the kind of, the point, kind of view of companies, I think, certainly take your point very well. 
uh, in terms of how do you ensure some sort of monitoring for companies in the same way that you would currently now for, for countries. I mean, the stock exchanges are increasingly putting in place mandatory disclosure, um, the European Corporate Sustainability Directive, they're going to introduce that as well. But the company's own pledges, that is the question. Um, so I think we're um, sort of uh, running close to the time and over time there's been a lot of questions, but I just wanted to check whether or not there's any questions from the floor before an opportunity for those. And please introduce yourself before you do so. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for the opportunity of, uh, of asking and uh, for, the, for, for your very interesting presentation, sir. Um, uh, my name is uh, Valerio Piccolo and I am a research associate here at uh, NUS at the Center for, for Maritime Law. Okay. And uh, uh, you mentioned uh, transport as one of the sources of the GAG emissions. And uh, uh, I was wondering what is your opinion about the IMO greenhouse gas strategy and um, uh, how the Paris Agreement uh, have influenced it. And uh, just a quick comment on uh, what uh, Dr. Nilo Ferrara said before. I actually I partially uh, disagree on the uh, very pessimistic view on the role of the uh, state, just because it's true that we have always have to, to monitor and to be uh, careful about what they do. But we also have to keep in mind that a lot that have been done by, by I mean, what the, the targets that there are now about climate change are from states discussing at international organizations. So their policies are from, yeah, comes somehow from their discussions at international organizations, and it's always up to member states to decide. So just, this is my, my point. Thank, thank you, thank you very much for that. Danny, would you have a point about the IMO greenhouse gas strategy? So I think with the IMO, like with all these others, it's a matter of whether you view the glass as half empty or half full. So the IMO was one of the first uh, organizations to take action on greenhouse gas uh, uh, emissions. So they adopted uh, uh, amendments to the MARPOL agreement uh, providing for ship efficiency standards in order to try to cut emissions. And that was really the first mandatory, uh, legally binding sectoral measure taken internationally, and that was predates Paris. Um, uh, then since Paris now, I think Paris has had a big effect in that all sectors now are seen as being a uh, need to align what they're doing with Paris goals. Um, so the uh, maritime emissions were purposefully um, taken out of the UNFCCC process and put into the IMO back in Kyoto, so dating back quite some time now, uh, on the theory that um, the approach taken in the UN regime, which is focused on what territory emissions come from, doesn't really apply to ship emissions where navigating internationally. So it's been a sectoral approach. Uh, they did adopt mandatory standards of a modest kind. Uh, Pre-Paris, the strategy now is to try to align what IMO is doing with the Paris Agreement goals. I think it's, uh, I haven't been following that really closely recently, but I think it's too early to say. I think there's discussion now of uh, developing a market-based mechanism under IMO um, and so. And, uh, so I think there's definitely movement there, but it's again probably not as fast as many people would like. Thanks very much for the question and for the response. So indeed, so far we've done today, we've done a survey, a magisterial survey of the of the, of the climate change regime. Uh, so safe to say, it's been uh, a mixed grade. In some areas, uh, I think we would agree, have done better than others. Um, it's a slow process, but it's an incremental process. I like to think we're moving in the right direction. Optimists at heart. Uh, we wish it be a bit faster, but you know, we're getting there. Um, so with that, I'd like to end off, but before I do so, I'd like to give each of you, you know, an opportunity to say, perhaps in a sentence, what do you think would happen? What would you like to see at COP27? And what do you think well, actually you will see at COP27? It's a bit of a crystal gaze, but I thought it's a nice way to end off the evening. Yeah. Thank you. Linda, could you start off, and then Dan, and then Nilufa, if you could close us off. Um. Where I would like to see in COP27, like this is ideally utopically, um, we get the financial support for developing countries and also loss and damage is suddenly discussed openly and then uh, manage to find all the mechanism right away. <laughs> so I know Glasgow said we still have uh, three years to you know, discuss the L&D, but I think, I think when states are losing their territory uh, due to sea level rise, I don't think we have time. <laughs>
I don't think we have three years. Well, I uh, guess I have somewhat modest expectations for Sharm el Sheikh. Uh, I guess I hope that they find some magic formula that will uh, allow uh, parties to be sufficient progress in finance so that it doesn't undermine the rest of the regime, but I think it's going to be modest. So it's a question as to finding that formula that uh, the sweet spot that satisfies all the parties. Um, but I think the, uh, uh, I think to the extent there's some new NDCs that strengthen what countries have pledged, I think that will also be a positive outcome. All right. Uh, well, I will add something that we have not discussed about here, but something that we talk about quite a bit elsewhere uh, has to do with the climate ocean. Uh, and I hope that the ocean um, is now part of the process, at least informally. But what I would like to see come out of COP27 is really um, laying the foundation for a formal integration of the ocean into the process uh, for mitigation, decarbonization of the ocean. Um, and, and right now, for example, NDCs a lot of them are, but it's all voluntary. I think we need a little bit more structure in how we're going to address ocean issues, acidification, deoxygenation, sea level rise, which can be associated to some degree with the degree, but not everything in the ocean can be solved by 1.5 degrees. So that's what I, what I would like to see come out. Thank you very much, and I look forward to that. Uh, so that kind of ends our session for today. And thank all Daniel for this speech, then and our two panelists, and to everybody who is here, uh, who's been patiently sitting through uh, what I hope was a very interesting discussion. Uh, Nilufa, may I invite you to formally close us off, if you like? Okay, well, may I just say that may I thank you, Danielle, for your excellent moderation. I think you've done wonderfully. And I just also want to thank Dan for your brilliant um, lecture today and Linda as well for your insight and all of you for joining us today. Um, I think that it was truly um, insightful uh, getting that 30 year reflection and thinking about some of these issues. The one I regret we couldn't have more discussion time with all of you, but I hope we'll continue um, this um, dialogue on the very important issue of climate change, particularly for the region for Singapore. Um, so thank you all, and, uh, and for all those, of course, who organized this. Thank you so much.